What I want to do is talk about our water resources in town and particularly a focus on, uh, on climate change. So that's the uh, goal of the presentation. And I, you're going to see uh, some slide whipping. You're going to see a lot of maps and, and uh, aerial photos like this. Can everybody make out the, uh, the uh, border, borders of Sherborne? And I hope you notice the uh, uh, big difference that our, our town really uh, uh, represents uh, from the bird's eye view and, and a lot of views. And uh, that's what attracted uh, me to Sherborne uh, and our family, and I think a lot, a lot of you. And uh, we have some incredible natural resources uh, and, uh, and they're at risk. I want to talk about that. Here's uh, the organization of the talk. And I've got it broken down in, in about six uh, agenda items, about uh, uh, three or four slides each. And uh, I'll, I'll do a little introduction, kind of make sure we're all on the same uh, uh, page when it comes to some water resource concepts and uh, then get into some uh, climate change comments. And then I want to get down to kind of the Sherborne level and get into the, those four risks that you see there. And that's where I, I consider some of the major risks to Sherborne with the uh, coming climate change. And I should mention, uh, I'm recently retired, so I have a little more time now. So uh, I've actually uh, joined over the last several years three committees. Uh, as Dorothea mentioned, I'm, I'm on the Energy and Sustainability Committee, a lot of, a lot of cl uh, climate change focus. I'm on the Groundwater Protection Committee, a lot of uh, we, uh, water resource uh, 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 considerations. And then uh, I'm op also on the Open Space Committee. I really enjoy uh, our open space. And up here, you'll see there's posters from uh, the open space plan. So that, that's kind of, uh, you know, where, I, where I'm coming from, if, if you will. And I should mention, I'm not representing any of those committees. This is my, <laughs> this is my take on, on the world. So uh, one of my favorite aerial photos is this from NASA? I, I'm sure you've seen something similar to this in different uh, articles you've read. And, and, and when I went to their website the other day to pull that down, I wanted to get a fresh copy. I, I learned something I never knew. It's been photoshopped. <laughs> it's, it's a mix of actual uh, photography and artistic license. But of course, it's a, a beautiful photo. Really puts it in perspective, of course, for all of us, uh, what's at risk uh, on, on, our, on our planet. And when it comes to water, uh, several of you uh, may know this, uh, but you know the majority of the water in, uh, on the planet is, is salt water, not really uh, uh, compatible with uh, uh, human and animal life. And of that water, uh, of the, of the rest of the water, the two per two, two and a half percent, actually a fair amount is in the ground, groundwater. So we have a lot of groundwater to work with. Surface water, I'm, I was always surprised at such a low number, surface water. Oh, yeah, just one percent, our rivers, our lakes, our ponds. And, and actually, if you take a look at that one percent, the majority of it's actually at the, at the polar uh, at the polar uh, caps in uh, in, in uh, ice, rivers a uh, half percent. So it's it's amazing how limited uh, these resources are. Another important, very important concept. Talk about water resources is uh, uh, the concept of the watershed. And maybe maybe you had this in school. I I didn't have this in school. Didn't appreciate that later in life. But uh, if you really want to look at the, the quality of water uh, underground or, or surface waters, it's, you, you want to look at the contributing watershed, the contributing watershed. And uh, the definition from the USGS is a pre precipitation collector. So it's the, the land that's contributing. So you have at a mountain ridge 
a separation between two watersheds. You know, is the water going to roll, roll left or right? And you can look at watersheds at, at all different scales. Here's a you know, huge scale for a continent. You see the Mississippi River, Ohio River, uh, St. Lawrence River, uh, different watersheds. But you can also look at it at a, at a, at a much smaller level. For instance, I, I, was, I used to be on the Farm Pond Advisory Committee. And uh, in terms of Farm Pond, which we're actually we're going to talk to at the end of the talk, uh, one, one thing nice about Farm Pond and why up until late it stayed fairly protected, it actually has a very small contributing watershed. Uh, unlike some lakes, which have many square miles uh, draining uh, uh, neighborhoods, a very, very small area. So th this is a good thing to be aware of. And then I'm not going to I'm not going to uh, go through entirely this beautiful USGS poster, but the other other thing to kind of keep in mind is the flow of water. You know, flow, water, water exists in three states, you know, gas, solid, liquid. It's moving from the atmosphere. It's coming down as precipitation. It's running off into uh, rivers and the ocean. But it's also uh, filtering into groundwater. And actually, groundwater actually gives up water to, uh, to lakes and rivers. And we're going to talk about that. And uh, actually, with uh, climate change, that, that, that brings some uh, important things uh, up. That switches us now to climate change. And uh, I, I'm, I'm a chemist, so I like to you know, look at graphs of molecules like carbon dioxide and things. But I hope uh, many of you have seen uh, you know, graphs like this. And this is the summary of the dilemma uh, all of us on, on planet Earth are facing that due to the uh, the dramatic rise in uh, emissions from uh, fossil fuel use that are traditional over 800,000 years, our traditional range of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that used to range from about 180 to about 280 parts per million, we've dramatically disrupted that. And it's actually very important that the planet had this stable range of carbon dioxide, because carbon dioxide actually is, is a greenhouse gas, and it actually helps maintain the temperature of the Earth in a constant uh, range. The uh, infrared rays from uh, the sun, without that level of carbon dioxide, they would just reflect back out into the atmosphere, and you would have a very cold situation that you and I could, uh, couldn't live on and what other planets uh, experience. So it's important to have that. The problem is now we're expanding the walls of the thermos bottle. And we've got too much carbon dioxide. And, 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 and at, at, at current emissions, it keeps going up every year. And it's going up at an accelerating rate. And that's the problem. And so the Earth now is heating up. This is a temperature graph, a uh, nominal change of uh, average across the Earth. These numbers always look small to me. you know. Can we hold it to one degree? Can we hold it to one and a half degrees, two degrees, three degrees, whatever model they're looking at? But as we're going to see, those, those just have tremendous, tremendous changes uh, in local, in local uh, climate and weather. By the way, stop me at any time. If, if I lose anybody at asking a question, feel free to. This is a busy, busy slide, but I want to focus up in this corner right here. This is a nice slide I stole from uh, Charles River Watershed Association. What what are we face? What we're facing this today, and we're going to face it. It's, it's just going to get worse with time, which is increasing temperatures, increasing frequency, intensity of storms, and 
it, it's funny. It's hard to uh, get your head around. M more rain, but also more drought, more many droughts. So kind of interspersed periods of drought and intense uh, precipitation events. For instance, in the Northeast, for some reason, uh, we've got a mixed situation. We act, we, we're actually blessed with very high precipitation. Uh, we, we get the most precipitation, you know, compared to say the far west and the middle west. We, we average about 43, 45 inches precipitation a year. We have been averaging, and it's been very equal, if you can think about it. We typically get about three, three and a half inches a, a month, a typical year. However, in the last several years, uh, we were seeing a, a higher frequency of more intense storms, and we're seeing them more in the uh, colder months and not, in, not so much in the summer. So that, that's a problem. Uh, some issues we're all, already seeing is infrastructure. This actually be some photos I got from our DPW department. They did a fantastic job repairing a culvert under Washington Street, down the street from my house. After some huge, so we got some very big storms in uh, uh, September 2021. And Washington Street, essentially, underneath it was washed out. And it's lucky uh, there were, wasn't any serious accidents there. Uh, turning to this half of the slide, I mentioned trying to, in our mind, trying to figure out what this means for a, a one degree or two degree uh, nominal change worldwide. Uh, for, for the Northeast US, and this is from a, a nice report recently uh, put up by the state, notice the type, the type of climates Massachusetts residents are gonna feel in the next several decades, it's 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 just it, it, it's re it's really uh, shocking. Uh, I, I've traveled up and down 95, so I know what the climate is uh, with my friends in the South, and this is going to be a very different field in Massachusetts in 2050 and uh, 2070. So I want to want to run through some risks. Let's start with uh, risk number one. And I should have mentioned uh, a lot of times, particularly on groundwater protection committee, or if I'm talking to groundwater people, we usually talk in water risk uh, very simply, am I talking quantity or quality? Often they're interrelated, related, but, but sometimes you can just keep, keep it separate because that that's might be all you're focusing on. The state is really worried about uh, our future droughts and has set up a major uh, drought management task force of all the agencies under the uh, Executive Office of Environmental Affairs, so the DEC, the DEP, and uh, all kinds of uh, state agencies. So these are some graphics from their uh, drought management task force. This happens to show a map, and I, I wanted to show it because I wanted to show you Sherborne. Any, anybody's not aware what Sherborne looks like in the state maps. Uh, and this happened to be a drought I want to talk about, which was last summer. Last summer was a record drought in Massachusetts. Can you expand the vision? Right here? No, the <clears throat> definition of the road for the covers. At the level of one. Yeah, the level one, two, three. You sure, thank you. No. Great, great question. In terms of levels, the state of Massachusetts came up with a scheme with these levels. And they go to, right now we're at level zero. Go to the Drought Management Task Force, you'll see a map that's all uh, white. We're in level zero, normal. Normal precipitation, normal groundwater, normal river flows, and there's about 10 different indices they use to come up with this, with this call, what level we are at. And then they have certain trigger marks. If the groundwater tables fall to certain levels, if the river flows uh, slow down to certain levels, they then ratchet things up to these different levels. You'll see uh, one, two, and three. 
So here, the, the time that this decision, December 8th, the Drought Management Task Force, they normally meet monthly, but during the drought, they were meeting every two weeks. They put uh, uh, these three regions, including ours, in a level three critical drought. And that, that means a lot of things uh, in a regulatory uh, stance. Uh, public water supplies have to ban all, uh, all, all lawn watering and uh, all kinds of uh, restrictions. Uh, and, and it's interesting, even a state as small as Massachusetts, it will vary across the state, the drought uh, implications. But we, we were in a very large drought. And one example, a couple examples, it was such a large drought throughout New England that the USGS wrote, wrote a special report about it that just came out. And my, my, my measure of how bad the drought is, is at Farm Pond. That's, that's, my, that's, my, that's my gauge, is Farm Pond. So I don't know, if anybody recognize the boat ramp uh, right here? If you get down to Farm Pond. Normally, like actually right now, normally after a, a winter and spring a storm levels and larger precipitation during the winter, Normally, the level gets close to the marks on the rock, and up to maybe the, about the third or fourth um, uh, line of the, uh, you know, of the uh, uh, ramp that they built about 10, 15 years ago. Uh, right now, it's right here. We're still not up. We still haven't recovered from 2022. We still haven't recovered. But I've never seen the pond this low. And from that mark, it's about a four or five foot drop. I've never seen it that low. Uh, but much more technical is the, USG, the USGS data. This is a stream gauge output from uh, the Charles River. It's the nearest gauge to us. It's in Dover. And it's kind of a busy slide. But the black mark, uh, the black line, is uh, the flows in uh, the discharge in cubic, cubic feet per second at that gauge. The black line is all of 22, and, and that, that reading was, uh, that screen capture was from the November. But this day, I, th I believe it was like August 22nd, they got to the record that that, that gauge has only been there 83 years. That's the lowest they've ever seen it. It was less than 5% typical flow, less than 5%. There's huge ranges in the river, as you can see. This is actually a log scale, so there's huge uh, uh, flow changes. But that is scary. It's very scary. That's that. You know, we've we've never seen we've never seen you know in our lifetime the the Charles that uh, there's a bunch of other uh, uh, records that were broken. One of, the re one of the reasons that I learned and reading more about droughts in the last two years, I, I didn't uh, follow some of the stuff until recently, is if you dig into the weeds, if you will, about what, what's going on with the groundwater, that's what I want to try to show here, is we all think of precipitation coming down, coming down right now outside here, <laughs> the rainy days. Uh, doesn't that restore river flow and, uh, and, and groundwater and everything? Well, it does, but it takes time. It can take days or years uh, or centuries for uh, uh, all of the ground to be restored. And the center of this uh, slide, I want to focus on for a second. This is a tip. This is a plot of typical groundwater recharge rates, and I'll explain that. It's in inches per month. And I should have put right here the, like the precipitation for, for that. But I, I, I can tell you precipitation averages around here three and a half inches a month. So we're getting three and a half inches a month most months. But the recharge to the groundwater 
measured by the USGS with groundwater monitoring wells, we're getting close to three inches a month in these cooler months. But guess what happens in the hotter months? We're not getting a recharge. Where's the water going? Here's where it's going. In the hotter months, and this was data averaged over the last, uh, you know, this, this 20 year period, the 80, 80 to 20, to, uh, 1981, 2000, they uh, ascribe that to evapotranspiration. Very long, long word, I trip over it. What's happening is we're getting the precip same precipitation in those months, but we're losing it very quickly. The ground is heating up in evaporation from the ground and the rivers and the plains. I mean, we're 80% of Sherborne is covered with trees. We're losing a lot of water during, during these months. And this happened to be a study, and I believe it was in the Merrimack River watershed. So you don't see Sherborne on that map. But uh, this is the town I would, I would uh, ascribe to Sherborne. You'll notice, uh, actually, you'll notice a difference some of the more uh, dense or uh, highly populated town, like Portsmouth and Dracut, notice that they, they don't recover or they don't get as good a recharge. And that's because, because they have a higher impervious surface, because high waste roads and everything. So this is very interesting. So if we're talking about higher, higher temperatures, uh, uh, we, it brings me to this quote, which is from uh, a, a report uh, that the local uh, planning uh, uh, organization came out with. Annual groundwater recharge is projected to decrease after the year 2030. I mentioned a couple slides ago, our precipitation rate is going to increase. Our precipitation rate is going to increase, but our recharge rate is going to decrease because of the higher temperatures at the same time. So we're not going to we're not going to outrun the higher temperatures. So it's a it, it's a difficult uh, problem we have. So I wanted to bring this down to uh, the residents here. What what do you need to worry about? Couple things. You really have to know and understand your individual well. Every we have 1,500 wells in this town. Everyone is different. Different depths, different locations, different depths to uh, bedrock. This is an example on the right here of a typical well in Shoreborn, because most of our most of our wells are, are bedrock wells. They're drilled 200 feet. My well is 330 feet. We have wells that are over 1,000 feet. And the, most of your water is coming from cracks in that solid bedrock. We do still have in town older wells that tended to be uh, shallower. Uh, you hear the name dug wells, board wells, older technology. You had to find a, uh, you know, an aquifer with, with a rich water source those types of wells are, are, uh, are uh, uh, people like to go away from them because you have greater threat of contamination from the surface. You're exposed to contamination. So you're, you, quote, might have a safer situation with a deeper bed, bedrock well, even though they're more expensive uh, to drill. But e even some of these deep bedrock wells have gone dry. In, 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 this, in this past drought. How long is this? 850 now. How long? 850. 850? Yeah, yeah that's a deep well. And uh, there's a huge fracking. Yeah, to get, and there's actually a good thing about deep wells. Uh, my well's 330 feet. My, my pump, uh, the typical well, uh, modern well has submersible pump, it is 300 feet deep. So I have a large volume, I have a large capacity, because groundwater might be 20 or 30 feet. So you have this volume of, of, uh, of water that you can draw. So that's, that's actually a good thing about the water. 
What's that? Keegan. Keegan got that in the shadow. Perhaps. Yes, we agree. Perhaps. Yeah. We're going to get there. Yes. <laughs> to help you, our, our groundwater uh, protection committee did, did a seminar last year. I highly recommend if you'd like to learn more about wells and, and everything and get ready for droughts, uh, you, know, you can access that. Let's jump to risk number two. The, the flip side of droughts, severe storm events. Uh, the Energy and Sustainability Committee in Sherborne has been, been active. We've participated in a very large multi-town uh, uh, grant. Uh, a couple of us on the Energy Committee are involved with it. Dorothea uh, is, is actively involved with it. And it's overseen by the Charles River Water Center Association and the town of Natick. And I want to show a couple things from that, because the the, uh, the uh, Charles River Watershed Association and all of the uh, towns that border the river, uh, a lot of a lot of interest in learning more about what's going to happen to flooding in this watershed with these larger events. And up here, I've got uh, some examples of what what we currently face for storms uh, uh, in a 24 hour period. You know, typical, typical big storms are three to five inches. I mean, I, I can't think of myself the last time we had a five inch storm, but a uh, five inch storm right now has about a 10% or t uh, 10 year chance of happening. Uh, as the projections grow out different models, those storm levels uh, you see grow. So that's the concern about how our infra infrastructure is going to handle. And, and this, if, if uh, numbers are, uh, you're not comfortable with, here's a graph showing those same numbers. So like a 25-year uh, a storm today, that's about a 10-year storm you know, 30, 40 years from now, much, much bit better chance of happening. Now, I had a hard time thinking about these numbers. So I hunted around. Can anybody remember the last time we got an eight inch storm or a 10 inch storm? It turns out not that long ago. Of course, we didn't get the brunt of it. But Western Massachusetts, I don't know if anybody remembers Storm Irene. Storm Irene was a hurricane. It was a level three in the Caribbean. I think when it hit somewhere in Florida, I forget where, uh, USGS wrote a story about it. Uh, I think it, it, it hit you know category two or something. It then went back out to sea, hit North Carolina, went back out to sea, hit in New Jersey, then hit Connecticut. Finally, when it got to Massachusetts, it was downgraded from a, from a category one to just a tropical storm. So it wasn't serious. And Western Mass got seven, eight, 10 inches of rain in 24 hours. Just huge, huge impact. So this is, this is definitely something that, that, that uh, all of us need to worry about. The Charles River Flood uh, Modeling Project, I want to show a couple slides from that because we're really learning a lot. And this is all the data we just learned in the last year or two. Here's a map of Sherborne. Hard to see a little bit the borders, so they're light shaded. These are people looking at modeling watersheds. So the watershed has a thicker line. That's the watershed divide between the Sudbury River watershed in the Charles River uh, in Sherborne. The Charles is uh, our border here. And uh, what I want to show is historically, we know from uh, the federal maps, the FEMA flood maps, we know historically where we have areas of flooding. If you've ever looked at FEMA maps. The good thing about FEMA maps is we have them, we know Historically, and insurance companies, every people, everybody worries about it. But the bad thing is about FEMA maps is they're looking backwards. 
They're not looking towards the effects of, of uh, larger storm events. And that was the purpose of the uh, Charles River uh, flood model. So I want to show you some, some looks from that viewer, which you, can, which you can look online yourself if you're interested. What you can do with the flood viewer is put in different what ifs. You can, and, and I put in uh, here, uh, you know, a big storm. I put in a 100 year storm for 27, 24 hours, 11 inches. So this would be a super storm. Uh, what's going to happen? If we look at the FEMA map, we, the Charles River, we're going to see a lot of flooding. Luckily, Sherborne, it's mostly open space, a lot of protected space, trustees and reservation, a lot of protected open land. And, and a lot of our streams are heavily protected. Uh, this is Dirty Meadow Brook. This is mo mostly open land. All you, although you'll see uh, potential flooding, certainly around 16. We see that occasionally now. Uh, Route 27, uh, up the Natick line, and also uh, the, the potential flooding near the bridge to Dover and the bridge to, uh, to Medfield. And these are modeled uh, depths, you know, the, the darkest line, three feet. Uh, these are just models. Uh, you got to take a, these with a grain of salt. Uh, their approximations, and do you see this funny shape here? It's a hexagon. That's the resolution of the model. So that's 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 30 or 40 acres. You know, it's a big area, but the elevation is changing so much that the model, you know, fights with with trying to decide depth. So it's an it's an estimation, but it, it it's helpful for planning. And I wanted to go to one neighborhood uh, because it's near my house. <laughs> and I, I showed you that photo of the culvert that, uh, that uh, broke through under Washington Street. There's that culvert right there. So I wanted to show you the Seoul Brook watershed. Uh, this is just a simple map, and this is the 2070 storm. Uh, the funny red lines are a combination of, uh, this is GIS mapping uh, we got from our town DPW. They have mapped all their stormwater catch basins and culverts. So along roads like here, those are uh, known points uh, from uh, the, the town's uh, GPS maps. From outside of the roads, you'll see some points those are kind of the modeler's estimate from USGS maps of elevations and water flows through wetlands. So it's, it's a mix of uh, approximations. But I wanted to show you, here is a fair amount of flooding. And luckily, it's mainly uh, protected, uh, actually, Army Corps of Air Engineer land. But there's definitely some, some, some edges of our roads and, uh, and, and uh, Route 27 that could be affected. And another way of looking uh, at this, here's that same map on the left. The Army Corps of Engineers, uh, may, many of you know this, bought up many acres, I think close to a thousand acres within uh, in Sherborne, uh, in about seven sites, and many adjacent towns in the Charles River uh, watershed in the 70s knowing that, you know, for flood control. So they have protected this huge area of uh, Seoul Brook. And that more or less maps this flood area. So they've protected most of that. But of course, the neighborhoods in all directions, we've, we've gotten in, in close to that. And on the Groundwater Protection Committee, we're actually mapping a totally separate project. We're mapping all the wells and septics in town. And so th this is very recent data. At some point, we want to kind of combine stormwater maps and the, and the wells because the, the, there's threats to wells from drought, uh, losing waters. There's threats to wells from flooding. Uh, you're, you're, you're contaminating your well if, if, if the, the water comes above the well casing. So it, it's definitely a concern. 
You're also flooding your septic systems. So you're going to have uh, issues with the contamination, potential issues. All right. Risk number three, and you brought up, uh, is my deep well safe? Uh, perhaps known threats. This, if, if the one thing I can uh, uh, educate people is uh, here in this town is the largest risk to the well that you own in your yard is what you're doing on your property. That's the largest risk. Don't, don't worry what's going on in, in, in Natick or uh, Ashland or wherever. What's going on on your property? And uh, this, this is an old slide from like looking at the hazardous waste, traditional, you know, landfill or hazardous waste dump. You know, uh, contamination, particularly, particularly chemical contamination that's not being degraded by, uh, by microbes, synthetic chemical uh, chemicals. They can travel a long distance they can travel very deep. And your bedrock well can have cracks, excuse me, fractures that extend hundreds of, of feet in all directions. So we're, we're not safe uh, with, with the, the thousand foot wells. We are safer than a shallow well, but we're, we're not completely safe. But everything we put on, on our property is getting into the groundwater. The pesticides, herbicides, I, you, know, you don't. Any, anything you apply to your property, you might drink out of your well. Just think, think of it that way. It's, it's that simple. Hazardous waste you have uh, hanging around the house. You really want to treat your septic system uh, quite carefully, make sure it's operating well. And finally, uh, oil tanks. It's a huge problem in this part of uh, the, the country, a lot of New England. We have older homes with older uh, uh, oil-fired uh, heating systems. You have 300 gallons of hazardous waste in your basin. That could fail at any time. Uh, very expensive. If you, if you have a, a leak larger than 10 gallons, you are a hazardous waste site on the state of Massachusetts, DEP rules. Now, very expensive uh, cleanups. Do whatever you can to have your tank inspected. Have it insured by ins your insurance company. Your insurance companies are required to uh, insure your tanks. Most of them do not let you know that. Uh, and ideally, long term, move off fossil fuels, move off the heat pumps, and, and get away from. Uh, uh, you know, oil, oil fired uh, tanks. Septic is such an important issue in this town. Uh, I, I decided to add a slide on it. And we have, a week from today, Tuesday, May 9th, a seminar like we did on drinking water wells. We're hosting a seminar on septic systems. So you can learn about how a septic system operates and how they're uh, designed and installed. A basic the septic system, you have a, mo a modern septic system. We still have 5, 10% of this town in cesspools, which has no leaching field. Uh, you have a tank where you, you uh, essentially uh, settle out solids, and then the liquids escape out into the leach field, and then hopefully, you're high enough from groundwater, and that's a, that's a big problem. We have a lot of areas behind groundwater in this town. Uh, you have enough travel time through the soil to quote, you know, what they've got on the slide here, purify. You're not really purifying. You're trying to reduce the amount of uh, uh, pollutants that get into your groundwater. That really works well for traditional things we worried about. We worried about uh, viruses. We worried about bacteria, uh, nat natural constituents, synthetic chemical constituents, lack, lack of this. They are not degraded by, uh, by uh, microbial action. So they, they are ending up in our groundwater. 
And this is actually a slide I stole from this presentation. These are many of the things you shouldn't put in your septic system to protect your well. And like, like what I just mentioned, uh, if, if you can't drink it or eat it, I wouldn't put it in your, in your I wouldn't uh, flush it down, you know. Paint, I, I, I don't want to drink paint, so don't, 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 uh, you know. Don't, don't put it in your septic system. It's, it's uh, really so simple. Should, that, if, yeah. if you cannot, of course you should not, where do you bring it? To the RTS? Those, those old, old paints, those... Hazardous waste. Our recycling, our town recycling committee does a very nice service. I, I think at least once a year, hazardous waste collection day. All your paints, your turpentines, your leftover uh, gasoline for the lawnmower, your, the herbicides and pesticides that you're no longer going to use again, uh, and kill all the, uh, the helpful insects for our pollinators. Take it to the hazardous waste day. For free, if you it's they usually have it in the early fall. Yes. If you had to pay for that, that would cost you thousands of dollars. Yeah. Business businesses, small businesses, pay thousands of dollars to dispose of these materials. You think the oil from the lawnmower water and this? Yeah, the oil, everything. Yeah. The yeah. yeah. Actually, the oils, uh, motor oil, the uh, the uh, transfer station. Has a collection tank for more. Yeah. 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 And any of us still change our uh, car or uh, motor oil? Oh, you don't have time. <laughs> it is one o'clock, Tom. So we're, 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 we didn't start, uh, we started 12 15 around, so you can. Okay. Have, I've got, okay, I've got, I got, I got 30 slides, so I got eight, eight more slides. Water, water quality, one last slide. Or actually, no, no, I got two slides. One, one uh, very important thought for private wells is uh, the Groundwater Committee actually did a, uh, a study uh, uh, just last year. We got uh, uh, connected with a very nice nonprofit in uh, Central Mass, RCAP Solutions. Uh, they work uh, heavily with uh, rural towns. Sherborne's considered a rural town under their definition, because we're all on, on private wells and septics. And so they did for free uh, a testing of uh, 41 homes. For these are the most common contaminants that you should be uh, testing in your well on a fairly frequent basis. What would you mean by fairly frequent? I, I would say I would say five years minimum, and most people. I hopefully most people that move into this town have tested at the time they buy the property. Some towns require that. Our town does not. The way in Massachusetts is all the private wells are regulated by the local board of health. So it's up to the local board of health to come up with regulations. Some towns require it at property transfer. Some towns require it on a regular basis, every year or five years. Inspection time. Ours, our town requires it at well installation. <laughs> so my well was tested in 1981. I've tested it several times since. I tested it last year when this was happening. My well was. And if you're concerned about your well, the cost, this costs you about two to three hundred dollars for all of this. Just just test for like nitrate and, and bacteria. That'll cost you about forty dollars, fifty dollars. That is a good sign of septic. That's a real good tip on it. Is your septic uh, reaching your well? But a really complete, I mean, $300, you know, do it. Uh, I mean, Sherborne water is fairly high water quality. 42% uh, of the, the, the wells did have an issue, and the vast majority, it was simple, what's called total coliform, 
which is natural color. If I lick, lick my hand on the podium here, I'm taking in total color. It's, every, it's everywhere. It's natural. But it shouldn't be in your pipe. It shouldn't be in your well. And it usually gets in there because there's a leak of air or water somewhere. There's a leak somewhere in the pipe. Uh, and, and you can have your well professionally dechlorinated and sanitized, and then you should never see it again. So that's what these people uh, were, were advised to do. You, you can smell it too from the water coming to the house. If you smell, if you smell your water, get it tested. <laughs> your water should not smell. No, you, you can no, some water, your water should not smell. So, what, what I actually also wanted to point out here, public water supplies in this state and most other states are tested very frequently. Depends on the size of the customer base, but the large, uh, you know, the towns of Lake Nantuck or Framingham, they're testing quarterly. And guess what? They're not at 42 percent. They're at five, four and a half percent. And also, it's typically colorful. Typically, yeah, colorful. I've given this small kind of like, um, you know, when you're taking very small study, very small. Right, very small. Very small. Yeah. Yeah. 41 homes are 2.8 percent of all households. Yeah. And it's very small survey. Right. Yeah. So comparing public and non-public water. And, and, and what RTAP actually is doing, if you go to their website, uh, you, you can learn more about that. You might be where you're heading with that question. Uh, they actually did, uh, I think they're up to 12 towns now. They've been doing this when we were in their second year. And actually, I think for the 12 towns, they're averaging about 35%. So they've done a lot of Western Mass towns. They've done a couple of uh, Towns in Eastern Mass. They, they did. Uh, I know Wellesley uh, last last. Uh, actually, with us, they did Wellesley, and they're running a little lower, but still much higher than, than the public calls. Oh. How does radon come to the groundwater? Radon is a natural gas from granite in your bedrock. Yeah. It's in the, a lot of us have uh, you know uh, trace levels of radon in our basement. That's, you definitely want to do a radon test for the air in your basement, separate from your well. But uh, besides the radon coming up through the uh, soil and the concrete into the air, the radon is also trapped in, in the water. Okay. So that'll, when you, when, at your faucet, radon is, is, is being uh, uh, introduced. So uh, part of, part of the, this water testing is they actually check for radon gas in, in, in the water. I thought it is only in the basement, in the atmosphere inside. Uh, the, uh, one, one, one route is inhalation from the air in the basement and the air that gets up the rest of the house. Another route is from the water, drinking the water and also standing at the faucet where the radon is quickly escaping uh, at the faucet. Yeah. But if you have a ventilation in the basement, that Your casing is taking water from 850 feet down. Okay. That's where it's throwing radon. Right right. Okay. Yeah. One, one last water quality uh, uh, topic, and it's the, the real growing topic uh, in uh, the water quality circles for both public and uh, private well, wells is PFAS. If you heard, haven't heard of PFAS, I, ho I hope you have. It's been in newspapers for uh, years now. Stands for per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. It's essentially a very common, uh, huge class of uh, manufactured chemicals invented in the 30s and 40s. Many products have come out of it, Teflon, and uh, you, you read a lot of things. Uh, what happens is the chemist found a way to take very inexpensive petroleum chemicals and replace all the hydrogens with fluorine. And that gave uh, these new products incredibly new properties, particularly water repellent properties, 
and slippery properties. So uh, uh, they found their ways in, in many, many different things. Many, uh, due, to, due to the known health effects now, have been banned, but there were so many millions of pounds produced worldwide that there are now background levels of PFAS in the air I'm breathing, in the water I drink, and in all the food I eat. So we have to worry about PFAS in, in, in everywhere. And uh, one key thing to know, there's a lot of known versions of the, of the uh, perfluorinated compounds. There's over 9,000. And that's probably, that, that's probably a, a, a low end of the guesstimate. Uh, turns out that there's traditionally uh, some a couple dozen that were manufactured in uh, the, some of the biggest toxicity concerns. So the analytical methods that we're now using are, are looking at any anywhere from 18 to 25. You're going to see some new methods out in a year or two with 40 or 50, and that'll grow. But of course, the, the analytical chemists are, are lazy or they're expensive. I mean, it's a big jump to add more more compounds to this on a practical basis. So, when I test my well for PFAS, this is what I'm testing for. And actually, a lot of environmental methods are like that when it comes to synthetic uh, organic uh, chemicals. But I wanted to bring this to Sherborne. Uh, we have two uh, pieces of data on Sherborne PFAS. One is the Mass DEP was so concerned about this. Over the last two years, they've done a very nice study that we participated in uh, of all towns in the state. They opened this to all towns where 60% of the, of the uh, homes uh, or greater were on private wells. And this is a real interesting map. See the color uh, towns? Ignore the shape. But all the color, that's the 85 towns. And notice, other than our, uh, our friends at Dover, which are right around, I think, 60, 65 uh, private, we're 95. Uh, you, you'll have to get up to Concord and Carlisle to find uh, other other towns. Most most everybody else is it is on MWRA or their own large town public wells. So, you know, uh, towns really have a struggle. They have, you know, somebody can do something in Framingham. You can't do it. True. You can't do it with the risk to our, our, uh, our groundwater. So uh, they rely on water from the quad out here somewhere. We rely on, on the water below our feet. But anyway, uh, we, we uh, had 34 uh, Sherborne homeowners volunteer anonymously. Uh, only the DEP knows uh, their names and addresses. Uh, and of those 34, the state current guideline for maximum contaminant limit for six PFAS chemicals. And every state has come up with a different uh, testing regime. Massachusetts, three or four years ago, picked six chemicals. And from those 18, would sum the concentrations of the six and decide are they over 20 parts per trillion. It's an extremely low, uh, low number. Typical environmental uh, measurements are the part per billion or part per million, many thousands of fold above that. But anyway, we, we actually had, had four uh, wells, unfortunately, above the uh, 20 uh, considered a health risk, about 15% of the town. Again, a very small, very small survey. Uh, statewide, that number is running about 5%. Good. 20% is the statewide, right? The, uh, the statewide above 20 part per trillion was about 5%. And that's about 2,000 data points. And I've been waiting for the report for about six months now. It's still not out. But, but Sherborne but is zero data requires zero percent. Nope. 
Sherborne had 15% of wells over 20 part per trillion, Fitbit, five wells of 34. Small number, small number, but I, I find it a little concerning that we're above the state average. But if you dig a well right now, drill, drill a well, that number, the contamination has to be zero, not 20 PPT, according to Mark. Depends. Sure, we for the health regulations. Yes. You definitely want to consult with them. I did. And I know they're in the middle of, of, of updating their regulations, and I believe you're right. I believe they're adding PFAS to the yeah. new regulations, but I don't know what their cutoffs are, so I won't, I won't comment. So this, this is being recorded. So have the Board of Health answer your question. Yeah, maybe I'll they, 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 they regulate our water. Yeah. But, but anyway, I, I see this as a concern. And, and an even bigger concern, and this, this is uh, uh, the, the levels of PFAS in our public water supply is in Sherborne. We actually have 14 small public water supply wells that are regulated by the DEP and not the Port of Health. This happens to be the results for the last 18 months in uh, this table and then in a graph uh, for the PFAS 6 over the last 18 months for the well that's serving the building I'm standing that This well serves uh, Fountain Campus serves the library, serves the uh, town offices, serves the police station and the community center. They've had three instances above the current mass 20 uh, per trillion limit. For a well of this, there's different categories of, uh, of regulated wells in Massachusetts. That's why I don't want to talk too much about the ice because I don't know all the regulations. But I know for the town well, they watch the last three monthly reads. And if, it's, if the average of the last three months is over 20, that, that means a big deal and, and the town has to respond. But uh, even with this very high, very surprising jump, but again, these are very low numbers, very per trillion, uh, the town well is still below the 20. So that's a concern. And if you look at the rest of the town wells, what's, what's a, a real troubling factor is the majority of our public water supply wells are clustered in our downtown, oldest part of town, smallest lots, oldest septic systems and cesspools. And what I've got listed here, and all this data is publicly available, is the mass, uh, 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 the uh, well ID number. I've got names of the wells that are publicly owned by the town, and I have stripped this of the businesses and churches because I, you know, I do. I mean, this is a public forum. I don't feel comfortable. Uh, and and uh, but but the, most of, most of the wells are uh, the commercial establishments and, and the churches. And to confuse you, but to illustrate something, I picked the highest level ever observed from these wells in the last 18 months. This column is the PFAS 6 number that I've been talking about. So in red is wherever we had numbers above 20. What I've added is, and what I haven't told you, is a little over a month ago, or uh, where we May, uh, a month and a half ago, EPA dropped their limit from 70 parts per trillion of two of the constituents, BFOA and BFOS, from 70 to four parts per trillion. Mass DP hasn't responded to this. They will in the next year or so. So this number is going to drop. But if I add the wells that are below 
the proposed EPA limit, and this is now under review and will take a year or two to come out as, as, uh, as regulations to the 50 states. We, we pick up all of these different wells that are now above the new uh, health advisory. So it's, it's a concern. It's a concern because this is going to add treatment costs to all these wells. And, and, and this is a concern for our, our private wells, too. Last topic. Last but not least, surface waters. We've been talking about groundwater. All of these same pressures of climate change, temperature increases, uh, stormwater events, uh, drought, they all are, you know, you see, you see it, as you can see, our surface waters. Uh, so this is a nice Google Earth uh, photo of uh, Farm Pond. Farm Pond has drastically changed in the last three years. And, and it's, it's quite unfortunate. I wanted to point that out. And I, I blame it on climate change. We still don't have all the data we need to, to nail that down. But that, that's some of our... Uh, our hypothesis. But uh, this is a busy slide, but I don't know if any of you are aware, but we've had a series of algae blooms. Actually, these green, uh, this is off the uh, Yacht Club dock, uh, late August uh, of last season. Uh, that's actually a combination of both green algae and blue-green cyanobacteria which are two different species, two different uh, genus of, uh, of uh, organisms. There are a lot of similarities, but there's some differences. But uh, uh, this is a picture. Of course, I grabbed one uh, for one of my kids. Uh, I wanted to fi find a photo that showed you know, how clear farm pond uh, is, is normally. And actually, farm pond is typically uh, we've been we've been testing the clarity of, of farm pond for over 25 years on a monthly basis. It, it averages just over six meters, which is about 20 feet, which is more than you know between uh, you're about 15. From, it's about here to that post over there is 20 feet. So that any of you that that know farm pond know we have very clear water. The last three seasons, we've seen really drop-offs as the warmer months came. This this past season, it dropped off a cliff. This was one of the scariest things I've seen in my life. We got down to uh, around a meter in September. Luckily, the beach was closed by then. And we actually have state regulations that require public uh, beach closings or uh, swimming pools if you don't have clarity better than 1.2 meters. Because that means you can't see your feet. You can't see a toddler uh, under the water. So we, we reached that last summer. So it's a very big concern. Uh, the Farm Fund uh, Committee has a uh, consultant uh, hired and just last month started really going to expand on the uh, the testing and try to determine uh, a lot of the uh, sources. We know a major source is was the drought, combination of drought, higher temperatures, and nutrients. And this is a busy slide. We won't go through all of it, but uh, the way you get cyanobacteria is food and temperature. They like warm water. They like, they like a lot of uh, phosphorus and uh, nitrogen. And in, in, uh, farm ponds, what's called a phosphorus limited lake. Uh, other, other water bodies like, like ocean waters, estuaries, uh, like down in Cape Cod, they are nitrogen limited uh, water bodies. So they, they're driven by nitrogen concentrations. But we, we've known for years that we had all this input, you know, you know any, any lake, any river gets all these inputs of phosphorus. Phosphorus is a very natural element, and it's critical in our body. We, we, we use phosphorus for many different uh, functions within our body. Uh, but uh, farm pond traditionally 
We measured it uh, once or twice a year, sent it out to a lab. Traditionally, it was about eight parts per billion, which is indicative of a very clean lake. You can see actually that clean water, very indicative of, of a clean water. Uh, lately, we've been measuring, and we were instructed to measure uh, more at depth. We were measuring at surface. In late summer, we're getting uh, phosphorus levels of, of 50, 60, 70 parts per billion. And that's indicative of, of a lake with, with uh, algae blooms. So we're trying to get to the bottom of that. A lot of that uh, is, is, is well known by the experts, and, and now we're learning it uh, the hard way. Uh, a concept called internal phosphorus loading. A lot of our inputs have been trapped of phosphorus at the bottom, and they were safe there. They were trapped with iron. Iron and aluminum bind phosphorus chemically. If you have high oxygenated conditions, but with warmer temperatures, more growth, and a couple of other, other processes, we were losing oxygen at a faster rate at the bottom of the pond. We, we, this is the hypothesis that we're releasing phosphorus from the bottom. And this is very well known. Uh, in the last couple of years, every lake, every lake has seen this. Even lakes, like farm pond, that were very traditionally considered what's called an oligotrophic, oligotrophic or low nutrient lake, we are no longer considered that because we're getting these bursts of phosphorus. So that is. Uh, thank you for staying with us. That is my official last slide, Dorothea. I lied. It's 31, not 30. But that, that's just as a summary of, of, again, I've mentioned some of these things. We have to reduce the effects of climate change, and that those are some of the things that, in my opinion, we should focus on. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you.